Take your Bible this evening, if you would, for our scripture reading to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. If you get to Matthew, you passed it up. Go back to your left, all right? And the last book, Matthew chapter 3. <clears throat> and we're going to read verses 6 through 12. Malachi 3, and we'll read verses 6 through 12, and we read them responsively as we normally do, begin together on 6, and I'll read 7, we'll alternate like that, until we end on verse number 12 together. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing please to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 6 of Malachi chapter 3. Ready? For I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes." And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture together here this evening. Lord, I pray once again that you would help us to give you our undivided attention as we look into your word tonight. Thank you already for the good music this evening, and it's been a delight to sing praises to you. Lord, it's been helpful to us to dwell on the words of these songs, and Lord, we're asking you to continue to make our hearts ready to receive your word tonight, and that you'll give us all ears to hear what the Spirit would say to your church this evening. Bless the special, in Jesus' name, amen. have started out to follow Jesus. Every day, every hour, I want to be just a little more like my blessed Jesus. He means more than all the world to me. Oh, wonderful, wonderful is Jesus. He gave his life on cruel Calvary. He'll be there when I start to cross the Jordan. What a wonder for Savior is he. In his footsteps I will always follow. In his ever gracious presence I would be. Through the storms of life may rage, my Lord will guide me. What a kind and faithful Savior is He. Oh, wonderful, wonderful is Jesus. He gave His life on cruel Calvary. He'll be there when I start to cross the Jordan. What a wonderful Savior is He. Oh, wonderful, wonderful is Jesus. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer tonight as we come to once again to open your word and 
see the truth you have for us this evening. And I pray, Lord, you would give me clarity as I bring the message tonight. <clears throat> give the people the ability to listen and to hear. To uh, Lord, I pray that each of us would focus and give our attention to your precious word tonight. We, none of us would miss what you have for us this evening. Take away the distractions that are here tonight. Put a hedge around about this place and allow your spirit to have free reign. Lord, I pray that you would remove any obstacles that would hinder your spirit from working here in our midst. So have your way in each one of our hearts, please. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> you know, Malachi chapter 3, have your Bible open there if you would, but you understand something, unless we are obedient and faithful servants of God, fulfilling our obligations and our duties toward God as a child of God, God cannot bless us in the manner He would like to. Okay? God's blessings and His promises are conditional upon our obedience to Him. I think we can understand this. If you have a child <clears throat> that is rowdy or disobedient, won't listen, refuses to do what you tell them to do, I doubt you would feel they deserve a reward. If a child is constantly running away and not doing what you tell them to do, I doubt you'll go down to the store and buy them a bicycle. He'll just be able to get away from you faster than what he did before. Maybe you wouldn't do that, I don't know. In other words, you don't make it easier for a child to do that which he should not be doing in the first place, or you only create a monster that's harder to control, worse than the one you already can't control in the first place. <clears throat> We don't reward bad behavior or we only teach the child they can get away with whatever they want and still get what they want. Bad behavior ought to be rewarded all right, but ought to be rewarded with a trip to the woodshed. Amen. Or the removal of privileges, not the granting of privileges. Discipline builds the right kind of character into our children. Obedience should always be rewarded, but disobedience should always be punished. That's the principle of God. God begins an indictment here in chapter 3 of Malachi, <clears throat> an indictment against Israel. They had been disobedient to Him. They had not followed His commands. They had not been a, an obedient child, so to speak. And God has begun to judge them. And they're actually upset with God because He has not continued to bless them even though they've been disobedient to Him. And let me, while I'm here, help you with something. No amount of prayer makes up for disobedience. We deal with this in our uh, recovery program a lot. You know, if somebody says, you know, I, I want you to pray for me. Well, I can pray for you, but you have to be obedient. In other words, if you plan on going out and being disobedient, no amount of prayer for me is going to change that. You need to be obedient. And I can pray for God to help you because God will help you if you're endeavoring to be obedient to Him. If you plan on being disobedient, then God will not help you. <clears throat> and that's what Israel was experiencing. It's amazing that God was withholding His blessing from Israel and they were withholding God's tithe and offering from Him. And they didn't see that they were doing anything wrong. They thought God was doing something wrong. They're... They're of the opinion that, you know, I ought to be able to do as little as I can for God and God still ought to open the windows of heaven and bless me. I was found it humorous. I was reading an article 
And it's, the, the one minister said for years, we lived in a small town with one bank and three churches. And he said, true story. Early one Monday morning, the bank called all three churches with the same request. Could you bring in Sunday's collection right away? We're running low on one dollar bills. That's sad. I'm sure as Malachi wrote the words, he couldn't believe what he was writing. Will a man rob God? What a shocking question. Will a man rob God? Would a receiver rob the giver? Would a forgiven one rob the forgiver? Would a redeemed rob his redeemer? Would the protected rob their protector? He couldn't believe Israel would do that. But when they said, wherein have we robbed thee? God said, you've robbed me in tithes and offerings. It's pretty, as we look at this, we think, man, that's unbelievable. They would rob God in tithes and offerings that belong to Him and still expect God to bless them, care for them, provide for them, and protect them. But before you get too hard on Israel, ask yourself this question. I wonder if I rob God. Now, I'm not just talking about tithes and offerings, but we'll come to that. But I want you to think about maybe some other areas that we might rob God of what rightfully belongs to Him. For instance, we may rob God of our service. Service to Him. Did you know we're saved to serve? You're familiar with Romans 12 and verse 1? Paul writes to the Romans, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And that's just reasonable. That we would give ourselves not to die for God, though some have done that ultimate sacrifice. But the truth is, God is asking us to live for Him. Live your life for Him. And that's just reasonable to expect that from us. Uh, go over to the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. Would you please? Familiar verses to you, but I want you to see them tonight. Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2. We are very familiar with verses 8 and verses 9. <coughs> Excuse me. Where the Bible says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now notice with me, verse number 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. When you're created in Christ Jesus, you're born again. You're saved. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You're a new creation in Christ. So you're, you're saved, and you're saved, notice, unto what? Good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Walk, take repeated steps in them. What's them? The good works. God says, I saved you so you would work. I saved you so you would serve. I said, mentioned this morning, that was the mindset when I was a young man. Uh, you were saved to serve. You were saved and you were taught you're in the Lord's army and God's the commanding officer. And, and you report for duty every morning and say, yes, sir, what do you want me to do? When Paul got saved on the road to Damascus, his first question after he knew he was talking to the Lord, he said, what wilt thou have me to do? Man, I know Christians. I've studied Christians. I've followed Christians. I've watched Christians. Man, they all have something to do for you. What do you want me to do? And he told him what he would do for him. <clears throat> service, service. If a man feeds a cow, he can expect milk. If a man feeds a horse, he can expect labor. If a man feeds a hen, he can expect eggs. If a man feeds a dog, he can expect obedience. What does God get for feeding you? God saved you that we might live our lives for Him. 
We are saved to serve. You ever think about when Jesus said, no man can serve two masters? Either love the one and hate the other, or hold the one, despise the other. The, the, the point, don't miss the point there, you're going to serve somebody. You're going to serve somebody. And you're going to serve someone or you're going to serve something. You know, everybody serves something with their life. And you'll either serve God or you'll serve money or you'll serve God or you'll serve yourself. But you're serving something with your life. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I, I believe the Bible is God's Word. Well, I'm glad you do, but that's not what I ask you. I ask you, are you serving Him? Are you robbing God of your service? Well, Pastor, I, I, I cut my teeth in the nursery. I've grown up in church. I'm glad you did. But that's not what I ask you. Are you robbing Him of service? Notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Would you look there with me please? 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul writing to this church which really became an example church. <clears throat> Notice verse number 8. The Bible says, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. When you got saved, you know what you did? You turned from your idols, you turned to God so you could serve the living and true God with your life. We're saved to serve. Are you serving Jesus Christ? You know, it's time for God's people to start serving again. Not, not you know, we, we, we got to turn around. We got to get the mindset again. I'm here to serve Jesus Christ. I'm here to serve God with my life. I'm not just here to enjoy life. Listen, if I'm going to enjoy life, I'm going to enjoy life serving Jesus Christ. I want to enjoy my life serving God with all my heart. Serve the Lord with gladness, the psalmist told us. Be happy in the service of the King. It's, it's, it's no wonder, listen, it's, it's, it's hard to watch communists give their all to their cause, or humanists give their all to their cause, or the cults give their all to their cause, or the Muslim give his all to their cause, and Christians just give God lip service. And not true service. Happy in the service of the King. I am happy. Oh, so happy. I have peace and joy that nothing else can bring in the service of the King. Oh, I know. That's just a song we sing. Or is that a truth we live? Are you robbing God of your service? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, would you please? There's something else to consider here, and I want you to listen carefully. You can also rob God of your youth. 1 Timothy chapter 4. You can rob God of your youth. Notice what Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Paul is writing to a young man and is saying, Timothy, don't let anybody despise the fact you're young. How do you get them not to despise the fact you're young? You be an example believer. Did you know that young people, or you're listening to me tonight, you have the command in the Bible to be an example of the believer. Where did we get the idea that we don't have to get serious about God Do we get grown up. Where do we get the idea we don't have to get serious about God until we get through our high school and through college and we get ready to really start out in life? There's nothing like that in the Bible. Don't let no man despise thy youth, but you be an example of the believer. You don't have to wait till you're out of your teenage years to become a dedicated Christian. What's wrong with teenagers singing what adults sing? 
What's wrong with teenagers dressing the way adults dress? So many times churches have made the mistake through the years of always, always having the children out of the service. Always having the children outside and, and sometimes even the teens are separate. There, there are a couple of cases I heard recently where a teenager, a child came all the way up through the church and never did go to church. Never heard the pastor preach. Never knew what it was to sit still in church. Well, they turn 18, they're out of, out of, out of their, their teenage group, and now they've got to come to church. And guess what? They don't get a snack. They don't get to run around. And so then, you know what they say? Oh, church is boring. I don't want to go. And then there's articles written about, well, what happened to our young people? How come they're not staying in church? Because all you did, you spent the first 18 years of their life entertaining them, and then they found out that church isn't about being entertained, and so I don't want to come here, I'll go down the road, because you can find somewhere where you'll be entertained and you'll have a show put on for you. I believe God's telling us that He wants the sunrise and not just the sunset. That God wants the morning as well as the evening. God deserves your youth. He deserves the energy of youth. He deserves the enthusiasm of youth. He deserves the strength of youth. He deserves the excitement of youth. He deserves the memory of youth. I've, I've, uh, I don't know. I have no idea how many verses of Scripture I've memorized. I, I know this. The summer before I was married, I was 21 years old. Worked a job at work midnights. That's the only time I ever did that. Well, I threw papers from 2 to 5 a.m. But, I, man, I, I, I realized God made me to sleep at night. So uh, I didn't think I'd work midnights anymore. Amen? And, and when, when working at a, a tire warehouse in Akron, Ohio, and there were, <clears throat> they had two different foremen. One was a hard guy, older man, and he really kept everybody's nose to the grindstone and made sure they were working. It was a, it was a very strong union shop at that time, and, and honestly, I, I don't, uh, you forgive me if you're a big strong union man, but I, I've not had a good experience with unions. They, they had guys who were just flat out lazy. And I mean guys who when, when it's about 10 minutes before break time, they've got to start slowing down. Because you've got to start slowing down breaks in 10 minutes. And then by the time the bell rings for the break, then they're already halfway, they're already into the break room by the time the bell rings. And then they spend the break time and they sit there until the buzzer goes off to go back to work. And then they finally make their way slowly back to work. Some of you are shaking your head, you must work in the same shop I did. And, um, and, and so the 15 minute break turned into about a 25 minute break. And production is bad, well... The older foreman, he didn't allow for that stuff, but he, he kept you working, kept you hopping. They didn't like him, and he was a black man, and so they, they called him Idi Amin. Some of you from the 80s might remember that, or 70s. But they had a younger foreman. And we worked Sunday night through Thursday night. That was our shift, and that was our five-day week. If we worked Friday night, it's overtime. And, and you're talking, I'm talking about 1979. That's, can you believe that's almost 40 years ago? And uh, I got married when I was 11. And um, <laughs> my wife was two. And um, we, but, you know, so you're talking about guys on a Friday night back then, 40 years ago, making around $30, $32 an hour. And this guy on Friday nights, when he would be there, the young foreman, he'd take three other guys with him into the office and they played cards. I would go to him and say, what do you want me to do? He said, get lost. Get lost. So I took my New Testament and I'd go out behind a rack of tires, sit on the floor, and I'd, I memorized that summer, June, July, and August. I memorized 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. 
memorize. How can you do that? I had the memory of youth. Now I can't remember why I walk into a room. <laughs> yeah, you, you can relate to that, can't you? Young people can't. You know, come in, you walk in and say, what did I come in here for? What did I... Tanya tonight come into the office to copy her music to sing her special. And she started walking out with her book and left the copies laying there. <laughs> he said, wait a minute, I came in here to copy these. I better take the copies with me. And uh, Not saying that the memory of youth isn't with you, Tanya. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but I thank God I got to serve the Lord from my youth. I thank God I had a dad who said, you're going to be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival meetings. Anytime the doors are open, we're going to be there. Because you know what that allowed me to do? It allowed me to serve God with my youth. Don't ever, don't ever look at people who got saved like Danny Wright, other people who got saved later in life from a life of sin and drugs. Thank God that God reached them and God saved them. But don't ever, don't ever regret the fact you were brought up in a Christian home. These, these folks who were saved later in life, you know what Danny Wright would give? He'd probably give his right arm to have grown up in a Christian home. To have grown up with mom and dad who said, you're going to be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Don't, 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 don't rob God of your youth. Serve God with your youth. Be an example of the believer, young person, even while you're young. Thank God I was able to give him my youth. Don't rob God of your youth. Don't rob God of service. And then, of course, the, the text in the context of Malachi 3 is don't rob God of tithes and offerings. You have to understand, in the law, under the Jews, the purpose of the tithe, read it in Deuteronomy, was for the, the ministry, everything that God did came through the temple. All right? The, the Levites were set apart to God. They didn't own property. They didn't have any personal uh, wealth. They, they just served God. And they lived from the temple and in the temple. And they were provided for by the tithes of God's people. And so they were cared for Levites. But not only that, the poor, the fatherless, the sojourner, the widowed, all of their needs were met through the temple. And they were met by the tithes of God's people. Now, you understand, most of the time their tithe wasn't just money. It was agricultural. And so they, would, they had big storehouses, and they would store the wheat and the corn, and they would store the food. But that's how they fed the widows, and they fed the fatherless, and they fed people who needed help. The church did that. You know, there was a time in America when America didn't have welfare. Why didn't they have welfare? Churches cared for people. Churches took care of folks. But when folks left the church, who's going to take care of them? Well, then Uncle Sam had to do it. The government had to step in. But it wasn't the way it was, and it certainly wasn't that way in Israel. So that's what he means when he says, Bring ye, in verse 10 of Malachi 3, all the tithes in the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. Saying there, there'll be provision there so we can carry on the ministry of helping other people, not only the Levites, but providing for the stranger and for the widow and for the fatherless and for those who have needs. So God had chosen, now you bring that into our day with the church and you understand the ministry of the church the things that the ministries that flow through the local church are are there and function because of the giving of God's people. That's how there's meat in the house to be able to have the outreaches and the ministries that God gives to us. It's the ministry of the local church. Therefore, we worship God through the tithes and the offerings, and we're doing that so there'll be meat in the house. There'll be bread in the house. So, so we can reach into prisons and give men material to see them come to Christ and see them grow spiritually and see their lives changed. We had a fellow talk to us. Bob, what was that fellow's name who met us Friday morning? Remember the graduate? And he met us as soon as we came in the door. And he, he couldn't stay. He had a work assignment. Uh, he's getting out here in a couple months. Vandegrift or Vandegrift? Or, and... Uh, 
just just came down just to 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 thank us. He graduated the program. I think he's at a CRC and. He's been at Madison. He's only a couple months from getting away out now, and he's already talked to his pastor back home. And uh, they're gonna they're gonna have a, a different faith based program in their church, but he's gonna be involved with that, and he's gonna continue to reach people. And he just wanted to say thank you for changing his life. And boy, if you could have seen his countenance, you could have just seen the joy that's in his face. You know how that happens? Because there's meat in the house. Because God's people give. There's a uh, the, the, I can't begin to tell you the, the radio broadcast and the, the ministry that's been to people and, and the folks who uh, are, have come to the church, the folks who've been saved because of the radio outreach. But how do you have radio at five days a week unless there's meat in the house? Unless there's people who give faithfully to the work of God? How do you have a, a, a country fair, a, a, a community fun fest? How do you have a dinner day? Feed everybody a turkey dinner. How do you have outreaches like that unless there's meat in the house? And, and that comes from people saying, yeah, we understand ministry flows through the local church. And we'll give that, there won't, that there'll be meat in the house. And that doesn't even begin to scratch the, the other ministries and, and the times where you put some gas in somebody's car or you give somebody some money for food to eat or you give somebody a motel room for a night to, to get them off the street and give them a place to stay. On and on it goes. But the, 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 that's why God said the tithe is the Lord's. Because it belongs to Him. And if you hold that back, you're robbing from God. And I don't know who you want to take from. I, I hope you don't want to steal from anybody, but surely you wouldn't want to steal from God. You're going to need Him. I know sometimes people say, well, I can't afford to tithe. But it's interesting, people who say that oftentimes, they, somehow they can afford car payments, cable TV bill, an all-terrain vehicle. They can afford the four-foot TV screen in their living room. They can afford eating out five times a week. But they sure can't afford to tithe. Boy, that's quiet. God says He desires to open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. There wouldn't be room enough to receive it. But we have to be obedient. We just have to be obedient. The tithe is the Lord's, and as far as I know in the Bible, He's never rescinded that statement. He's never taken that back. It's still true. There were some people that went on a mission trip to Eastern Europe. When they came back, they talked about how they were so impressed with the dedication of the Christians in Romania. Christians there who did not have very much, but believed that they ought to tithe. They knew it was God's standard, but the government of Romania was very repressive. And they were only allowed to give 2.5% of their income to charitable organizations. They're trying to what they're trying to do is minimize any opportunity for any anti-government organizations to gain momentum so they limit what you can give. So the Romanians begin searching for loopholes in the law so they could give 10%. Here they are. They have less. They don't have anything like Americans enjoy. And they're looking for ways to be able to give 10%. We have more. We're free to do as we please. Free to give as much as we want. We have so much more than what they have. In fact, we get a tax break by, if we do give. We can, we can put it on our income tax. And we look for loopholes in Scripture to try to give less. God help us. What an indictment on our Christianity. The songwriter said, by and by when I look on his face, thorn shadowed face, beautiful face, by and by when I look on his face, I'll wish I had given him more. There's no one going to get to heaven and say, well, I think I gave too much to God. 
I don't think that's going to happen. Let's not rob him of tithes and offerings. Let's not rob him of our youth. Let's not rob him of our service. And then lastly, let's not rob him of our praise. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 13, would you please? Hebrews chapter 13. Notice with me, if you would, Hebrews 13, verse number 15. The Bible says, By Him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. Let's offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Do you rob God of praise? You know when you rob God of praise? When you take credit for anything. That's when you're robbing God of praise. Should the axe that cut down the tree praise itself or the one who swung the axe? Should the bat that hit the home run praise itself or the player who swung the bat? Should the brush that paints the picture praise itself or the one who Use the brush. Should the ball that goes through the hoop praise itself, or should the one who shot praise the one who shot the ball through the hoop? The tool doesn't exalt itself over the hand that uses it. What are we? We're only tools in the hand of God. We're only vessels in the hand of God. And the Bible says we're to be vessels unto honor. So why is it when when God uses us to do something for Him, we want the credit. We want someone to praise us. We want someone to mention us. We want somebody to pat us on the back. No, give the praise to God. May the glory go to Him. Whatever God does with me, why don't you just, just set it down. Whatever God does with me, he deserves the praise. He deserves the glory. Let me have you look at one example in the book of Acts, chapter 12. Would you look there? Then we'll be done. Acts 12. Here's a, here's a case where a fellow did not give God the glory. Here's a, here's a case where people started praising a fellow and he didn't give the praise to God. He kept it for himself. Acts 12, look with me at verse 21. Acts 12 and verse 21. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of man. They were praising him for his great speech he gave. And, and Herod said, yeah, that's me. I'm a great speaker. I really have a building. I'll tell you how good I am. Listen to those people. I think he was saying, come on, come on. Tell me more. But what happened? Verse number 23 immediately the angel of the Lord smote him. Why did he smite him? Because he gave not God the glory. He didn't give God the praise. He didn't give God the credit. He wanted to take it for himself. Not only did he, did he, did he smite him, he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Can you imagine seeing that take place? I think, I think if you just got a picture of that, you'd be careful next time somebody says, boy, you did a great job with that, that you better not say, well, thanks a lot. You better say, well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah, that God, praise you. Amen. I don't want, I don't want worms coming out of me. Eat me up. God, God takes this praise thing pretty serious. And He doesn't share that glory with anybody else. It's interesting when that took place, verse 24 says, but the Word of God grew and multiplied. Uh -huh. 
Isn't that ironic? That just follows suit. God's pretty serious about us giving Him praise. When's the last time you just praised the Lord? Remember, the, we're, we're to, the sacrifice of praise, that is, sacrifice of praise to God continually. You know why you get grumpy? You know why you have Blue Monday? You know why you get discouraged? Because you stop praising God. You need to keep, we need to praise Him continually. And that's a sacrifice. That's a, that's a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Make it a habit to praise the Lord. That, that great hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. That was written by Charles Wesley in 1739 on the one year anniversary of his conversion to Jesus Christ. One year after being saved, he was meditating and, and, and uh, writing music and writing songs and thinking about his salvation. And he penned the words, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Verse 2 said, My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of Thy name. Jesus, and by the way, He wrote this. He had been ill and He was bedridden. And He wrote this verse, Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease, tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. I love the last verse. You know what he wrote? He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. When's the last time you just praised the Lord that He breaks the power of canceled sin? That sin has been canceled when He paid for its debt on the cross, but it's not just canceled sin. He breaks the power of that sin over us. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Don't rob God of praise. Learn to praise the Lord. Take time every day where you just pause and you just wait and say, God, why don't you ask God, what should I praise you for today? Get out a piece of paper and get out a pen and write down what God brings to your attention. And then take a few moments and praise Him for His goodness to you. God inhabits the praises of His people. And so He's worthy to be praised. Amen? Amen. Let's not rob God of our service. Let's not rob God of our youth. Let's not rob God of, our, of His tithe and our offerings. And let's not rob God of our praise. Will a man rob God? I trust will not be guilty of that shocking question. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for recording this in Malachi for us. And as we've dwelt upon this thought tonight, this question that you pose to the children of Israel, to your chosen people, that they had robbed you. As we look through the Scriptures and we see the things that You expect from us. I pray, Lord, that none of us tonight are guilty of robbing You. But Lord, if there's areas that we've held back and we are guilty, that You'll convict us of that. We'll confess it to You this evening. And we'll desire to give to You what You rightfully deserve. We want Your blessing. We, we like to see the windows of heaven open and Your blessing poured out upon us. But Lord, we know that You'll do that only if we're obedient. You will not reward our disobedience. And so help us to give You our service, to give You our youth, to give You the tithe and the offering and to give You our praise. May Your praise continually be in our mouth. 
heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Before I finish praying, how many folks tonight would say, Preacher, God has spoke to my heart tonight. It may be a service. It may be youth. It may be tithes and offerings. It may be praise. But you'd say, Preacher, the Spirit of God definitely spoke to my heart tonight. And I want to make sure I'm not robbing God of any of these things in my life. Pastor, pray for me this evening. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Amen. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment, I'm going to pray and we'll have your invitation. God has spoken to your heart. Take time to speak to Him before you go home tonight. Respond to Him during this invitation and do business with God. Walk out the building starting a new week where you won't rob God of anything. You'll give Him service. You're going to give Him your youth. You're going to give Him tithes and offerings. And you'll give Him the praise that He rightfully deserves. Heavenly Father, have Your way in this invitation now. Thank You for speaking to our hearts tonight. I pray Your will will be done in each heart and life and each of us will respond to what You're telling us to do in our heart. Help each one of us to be obedient to You. And I'll thank You for it.